Well, um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's it's just a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you, Jessica and Joshua, for all the logistics and help and, and for your kind introduction. Um, so as Jessica mentioned, today I want to talk to you um, and may maybe introduce to some of you the concept of, of bibliodiversity. And hopefully I, I, I can make the case to you that it's, it's an extremely important part um, uh, principle for science and scholarship and something that really should garner more attention by our community. <clears throat> so CORE, um, we are an international association. Um, we have over 150 members from uh, 50 countries around the world. And as the executive director, um, I have, uh, it's been my honor actually to travel around the world to engage and learn about the context and issues related to scholarly communication in, in many different regions and with different countries and communities. And so these are some of the, the things I'd like to share with you today. So um, as a global community, um, we are more interconnected than we ever have been before. And many of our problems that we face around the world today must be addressed really at the international level. Of course, uh, climate change comes to mind in particular, but also um, COVID-19, the COVID-19 epidemic has really brought this to the forefront and made everyone super conscious of the need for international collaboration and sharing around science. Um, as uh, the head of, of WHO, um, Tedros Ghebreyesus says, it's not over anywhere until it's over everywhere. And this really underscores the importance of international um, uh, collaboration in science. But Another aspect of research is very important as well, and that's that research is, is also very local. And it's important that researchers are able to work on problems that are relevant potentially only to their local environments. And I think this local aspect of research has um, been increasingly neglected. And that's because um, of the way that we've really constructed the international research communication system and our research assessment frameworks. What we really want to achieve is a scholarly communication system that supports you know, the, the, the flow of knowledge in an equitable way internationally, but also allowing diversity to thrive. And um, diversity is an incredibly important characteristic of any healthy ecosystem, and that in, uh, in, uh, scholarly communication is included in that. Um, so these authors um, that published a blog on the London, London School of Economics blog argue, argue that diversity of academic content, both at the national and international level, is essential for preserving research in a wide range of global and local topics, studied from different epistemic and methodo methodological approaches, inspired by various schools of thought, and expressed in a variety of different languages. So this is not just really, when we talk about bibliodiversity, it's not really just about the formats or the publishing models. It's, to, it's about the ideas and the knowledge that is being shared and how those models and formats can either nurture diversity or inhibit it. So what we're trying to really achieve is, you know, uh, striking the right balance between supporting that diversity and yet enabling international flow of knowledge and communication. Um, bibliodiversity is the term basically that we use for diversity in scholarly communication. And it was originally coined by a group of Chilean researchers. Uh, or Chilean publishers, I should say, and they were really looking at um, diversity in terms of uh, book products that are available to readers. Um, but the term was later taken up by the uh, Jizya call for open science and bibliodiversity. Um, and this was um, a group of French organizations that were look at, feeling very concerned about the, the, the uh, directions of scholarly publishing. So they were really applying this term bibliodiversity to the whole ecosystem of scholarly publishing. 
And I think um, their concern was around the concentration of, of, of the large commercial publishers and scholarly publishing. And also as we tra transition to open access, you know, how the APC model for publishing um, could um, uh, be uh, uh, even worse possibly um, because it could further entrench these players in the system. So um, building on, on these earlier discussions um, at CORE, uh, myself and several colleagues um, uh, last year in April um, published a paper that kind of uh, outlines what are the issues around bibliodiversity in the scholarly communications landscape and also a call for action which identify specific actions that different stakeholders can take to try to address this decline in bibliodiversity. So what is uh, the current state of bibliodiversity in scholarly communications? Well, um, I don't have a picture here of a Brazilian rainforest, unfortunately. Um, you know, if we equate this to biodiversity, um, it, it's more, the current situation is more like this deforested field in Madagascar. Um, indeed, um, far from promoting diversity, um, the current system, uh, ecosystem of scholarly publishing really resembles um, something that Vandana Shiva calls the monocultures of the mind. And it's really characterized by the homogenation of publication formats. So the just the, the overemphasis on journal uh, articles, the consolidation of, ver of venues um, that have are owned by a, a small number of multinational publishers. And this issue really, you know, is an important issue that touches on um, the lives and the work of many researchers, but I think probably most acutely um, researchers in, in developing countries. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a systemic issue. It's baked into the system. So, um, you know, this discussion about diversifying your workforce uh, will not uh, improve the situation. It doesn't matter how diverse the workforce is at Elser, Elsevier or Wiley or Taylor and Francis. It's not going to have a huge impact on the current state of bibliodiversity. So um, to address this issue, we really need to make um, some systemic changes. Um, and there are four factors that we identified in our paper that we feel are the, that the, are the most important factors contributing to the decline in bibliodiversity at the moment. Um, and these factors are extremely interconnected. So when you talk about one, it's hard to talk about one without talking about the other ones, but I will try to do that for you now. Um, and they are the dominance of, of, of English language, the concentration of publishing services and infrastructures, um, very limited funding models for funding scholarly communications and a narrow focus on, on journal-based policy measures in our research assessment systems. So um, I'm just gonna take you through these uh, quickly. And then um, after this, I'm gonna talk about um, some of the changes that have been brought about because of COVID-19 and some, uh, you know, some of the solutions that are, are being introduced into the, into the ecosystem because I'd like to leave you with um, this lecture on, on a positive note. So um, starting with the, the dominance of, of, of the English language, um, of course, many researchers around the world are really obliged to publish in English, um, even if it's not their, their first language or their preferred language. And this brings a number of, of problems. Um, firstly, uh, when researchers publish in English, of course, the public um, or their societies, if they are non-English speaking societies, cannot really access and use that research. So um, the Helsinki Initiative on um, Multilingualism argues that the disqualification of local and national languages in academic publishing is the most important but often forgotten factor that prevents societies from using and taking advantage of research done where they live. Um, in addition, it introduces really important and significant biases 
in the system that favor native English speakers. Um, because non-English speakers, of course, um, will not be as good at um, naturally explaining or articulating their research in a, in a different language. Um, this can be, be perceived as a lack of quality of research article when really it's just that English is not their first language. Um, this essay by a Brazilian scholar talks about her experiences trying to express ideas in English. And she says, uh, doing that acts as a filter that strongly limits the encounters between Western theory and scientific cultures rooted in other languages. And I think what she's trying to express here is that you think differently when you speak a different language. And so there are some ways of thinking that can't be translated into English. And when, when, that, when you're forced to translate it into English, then you're missing something, you're losing something from that articulation. Um, there are actually quite a few journals, if you look at it, that are um, published in, in other languages. This um, was a study done in 2018, and they, they looked, compared Scopus journals with journals, you know, a, a, a landscape scan of, of journals from around the world. And they found that Scopus, which has about 20, at the time had 27,000 journals made maybe mainly in English, um, comparing that with um, 9,000 peer reviewed scholarly journals in other languages. So uh, this is quite a, a, you know, a big difference in terms of the native language speakers around the world and the, um, the difference between what is actually available in English and, and in their, their local languages. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there are some venues for, for those researchers, but the problem is also that those non-English journals are often not included in um, the indexing or citation databases. So because of that, they're not used in research assessment systems, they're not considered part of the predominant um, or legitimate system of scholarly communications. Um, I recall several years ago, someone um, equating Cielo journals, which many of you are probably aware of Cielo, it's a publisher in, in Brazil um, that publishes many Portuguese and Spanish speaking journals, you know, but um, this person equated Cielo journals as favelas, which are the slums in Brazil. So this is the kind of reputation that um, these types of journals are trying to have to deal with. Um, so, you know, all that to say uh, this, this emphasis on English is, is important in a way because we need a common language to share ideas, but it's also having a negative effect on, on bibliodiversity. Um, so uh, the second factor is concentration of publishing services and infrastructures. And I think for bibliodiversity to thrive, really, we need a variety of open infrastructures and services around the globe, sort of a network of community-driven infrastructures localized and serving the needs of, di of different communities. Um, but what we have been witnessing for, for decades now are mergers and acquisitions of large publishing companies. Um, and indeed going even beyond um, acquisitions around uh, journals, the whole life cycle of, of, of research communications is being captured by, by, these, by a number of large um, publishing companies. Um, uh, Vincent La Riviere and colleagues here in, uh, in Montreal, at the University of Montreal reported in 2015 that um, the top five publishers controlled about 50% of the market and um, it was uh, uh, up to 70% 70 for some specific disciplines. And um, we think possibly that it might be even a larger percentage now. Oops. Ah, I've, I, I did a Google search here um, with some of the large publishers with the word acquires after it. <laughs> and so you can see, I mean, I welcome you to do it. I invite you to do it yourself because you can see all of the different 
companies that they've bought over the years. So you see Elsevier, you see Wiley, um, Taylor and Francis. So um, they, these these companies have been busy, and it's in their it's in their interest really to try to again to capture this market. Um, many of you will have seen earlier this week it was announced that um, Clarivate has purchased ProQuest. So just another example of greater consolidation, which continues continues on. And this is really about you know. Um, who controls these services? Are, how are their functionalities being developed? Are they being developed based on the needs of, of research communities that they serve? Or are those um, services being developed really to drive up revenues and profit margins? And I think I don't need to answer that. The, the answer is obvious. Um, and that sort of brings us to the third funding model, um, uh, the third factor, which is uh, this limitation, uh, limited funding models we have available to fund uh, open services and infrastructures. And these, this is really exacerbating the issue. Um, there's a, a lot of money in scholarly publishing. Um, Elsevier has annual profits, not annual sales, but annual profits of, of over a billion US every year. Um, Claudio Aspesi, who is a longtime analyst of scholarly publishing, values the current academic journal market at uh, between 10 and 11 US, a billion US per year. So this is, is quite substantial. And um, well, a lot of this money <laughs> is coming from our community, our communities, the libraries, the library consortia, and in some cases, governments, um, which purchase journals you know, increasingly through big deal, big deal pa packages via multi-year licenses. Um, and anyone who's done these kind of negotiations knows that these, these packages, every time you go back to renegotiate, the size of the package has gotten bigger, the cost is bigger. And, and what happens is, is that a greater portion of library budgets, acquisition budgets every year goes towards the big guys and we, we cut off the marginal and smaller players from our funding. And this again is having a big impact on uh, the sustainability of the smaller open infrastructures and services. So we really need to think about how we can transition to some funding models, acceptable funding models um, that can allow libraries to um, redirect funds away from from the big large players towards those smaller diverse uh, groups. And um, well, let me stay here. I mean, the, 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 it's, it's not a small issue, it's an important issue because if you're a library and I'm sure most of you here are librarians, you really have to demonstrate that that investment is going to benefit directly your user community. And that's what's challenging around funding open, open services that are available to all. So there's a, this issue of free riders as well, like, well, the service will be available whether we fund it or not. So why should we fund it? Um, and I guess there's kind of maybe a conservatism uh, maybe or a reluctance in the library community to also to, to embrace new models. So um, I think, um, uh, one of the concerns around all of this is that as we transition from subscription-based journals and funding through big deals, we move through transformational agreements to funding a kind of fee per article model. And um, this again will leave out those, um, those smaller, smaller services. Um, and we've seen a fair um, number of vocal um, discussions around this um, in the context of, of Coalition S and, and some of the other uh, strong proponents of transformational agreements and what they will do uh, to impact, you know, these smaller community-based services. And, and uh, now that um, COVID-19 has, is probably putting a strain on many library budgets, I mean, this concern is, is even um, exacerbated, I think. 
So um, this is just an example of Red Alic, which is a, um, a, a publishing platform in uh, Latin America based in Mexico, but supporting Latin American journals who have spoken up about this. Um, this is a call for action by a group of, of researchers and book publishers who are trying to raise awareness of the community of the need to fund open book infrastructure. Um, and there are, there are many of these small, again, diverse services that really are concerned about uh, what's going to happen to them in the future. Um, as Jessica mentioned, I'm, I'm the executive director of CORE, but I've been a consultant for several, for many years with the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, which is the sister organization of ARL in Canada. And in 2019, we did a, a survey of all the library investments. Carl has, represents 29 of the largest um, academic libraries in, in Canada, and we, we undertook a survey of investments in open um, at those libraries. And it was a very detailed survey. We looked at everything. We looked at research data management, staff, um, uh, funding for conferences, um, APCs, membership models, anything that would be considered supporting or advancing or um, uh, 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 funding infrastructure services or money is going to, to open science. And um, what we found in that survey was that those libraries invest about one to 7% of their, their total library budget in open. And the average was 3.08%, so 3.1%. So this is, uh, I guess, in stark contrast to um, the average acquisition uh, portion of budget that goes to acquisitions, which is about 40, 42 or 43%. So there's a lot of work to be done, I think, uh, um, from the library perspective, from, from our world to try to, again, redirect some of those funds away from the large commercial publishers to these smaller open access um, and open uh, science services. Um, and the fourth factor I want to talk about is um, this focus on journal-based um, uh, measures for research assessment. Um, and I think this is actually probably the most important uh, and influential factor for all of this. Um, it puts so much pressure on researchers around the world, the research assessment to publish in high impact journals in, in the international journal system based in the North um, where editorial boards are based in the global North and they decide what research is important and what research should be published. Um, if you look at just one example, and there, there are many examples, but just one example is the time, uh, the world university rankings from the Times higher education. So what is their methodology? 30% of the methodology um, of, of the things that they're looking at is based on, on uh, citations. And not just based on citations, but citations in Scopus. So if you publish in a journal that is not indexed by Scopus, it does not contribute to your, your university rankings. And we all know how sensitive universities are about their rankings, how important it is for these universities. So this puts a, a tremendous amount of pressure on communities and researchers to publish in journals that are part of, for example, Scopus. And um, as I mentioned, you know, this is just one example. There are many other ranking frameworks that include the same thing. Sometimes they even have citations as even higher, higher rated than that. So, um, you know, this in a way, some people have um, called this, you know, a, a thinly veiled modern day form of colon colonialism because it, it forces researchers um, around the world to play this game, which is defined, the values are defined by the global north and by the large uh, publishers who own those journals. Um, 
And as I mentioned earlier, many journals are not included in these, um, uh, these, the, these databases that are used for uh, research assessment. Just to give you an example, if you compare, this is a, a slide prepared by um, Tim Olchuk at uh, DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals. If you compare the journals in DOAJ, Scopus, and Web of Science, you see that there are close to 8,000 journals in DOAJ that are not in Scopus or, or, or uh, Web of Science. And so they, those journals end up being, in a way, invisible. Um, there was another study done very recently in the European context where they looked at diamond journals. So those diamond journals are the ones that don't have APCs, um, but they're open access. And um, they found that a third of di only a third of the diamond journals they identified in this worldwide survey were, uh, were in DOAJ. So there's a huge um, number of small journals out there that are completely invisible. And I think this is, this is a big problem for uh, the uh, diversity of the ecosystem. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a vicious circle. Researchers publish in high impact journals to be recognized, therefore they publish in English. And in the so-called international journals that are owned by the commercial publishers. Um, and because there's demand for those journals, the commercial publishers can, um, you know, charge astronomical prices for subscriptions or for APCs, which in turn redirects money away from the smaller, more diverse open infrastructures, journals and platforms. Um, and not to mention it takes money away from all those other valuable research outputs that we would like and encourage researchers to share. So this vicious circle feeds right into the hands of the commercial publishers and into their pockets as well. Um, so that was the situation essentially in March until COVID-19 hit. And uh, I believe COVID-19 has come at an opportune time and it's a terrible disease, but I think it's going to push uh, give a huge push to open science, and it, it already has. Um, not only though open science, but also uh, bibliodiversity. So certainly we've seen unprecedented sharing um, around all types of research outputs in order to try to um, address the problems created in our societies because of of the COVID-19 virus. And I'll just point out a few things to you today. Um, first, the sharing of preprints has exploded. Um, I did a search in PubMed Central for um, COVID-19 articles in 2020 and 16%, over 16% of them were preprints. Um, and about 78% of them are freely accessible. And then I did the same search for cancer articles for 2020, and only 6% of the cancer articles are preprints with, with about 60%, 64% being free access. So I think that's a significant change, in particular the aspect of, of, of preprint sharing. And I also wanted to note that there's been some work done to look at whether those preprints significantly differ from the published articles. And we're finding a lot of evidence that for the preprints that are published, not all of them are, but for the ones that are published, there's very, very few changes, uh, substantial changes that happen between the preprint and the published article. And certainly the, the conclusion of the article uh, the articles do, ha, do uh, rarely, rarely change. The other thing that's been really interesting is the the speeding up of the time between um, uh, the publishing time. So um, this study looked at um, the time, comparing the time of article submission to acceptance to publication 
between COVID-19 articles and MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, syndrome uh, which is around 2018 it happened. And there were just really interesting and huge differences. Um, I think in particular, the time, the, the median time between submission and acceptance for COVID-19 articles was five days. And for the mayor's articles, it was 71.5 days. <laughs> so that's that's just an incredible difference. And anybody who you know publishes who's in the audience knows how, how long it can take to get published sometimes. And by the time you're published, you feel some that you're that the results you're publishing are kind of irrelevant or outdated. So um, this uh, uh, COVID-19 has really increased the speed of publication significantly. And um, articles were also made available. The publishers were essentially coerced <laughs> to, make, um, to make their COVID-19 related articles available. Um, this is a, a, a list that's maintained by ICALC. ICALC is the International Coalition of Library Consortia. And they, um, they crowdsource this list of publishers because um, again, most publishers agreed to make their COVID-19 um, articles freely available to everyone, but only for a certain amount of time. So uh, this screenshot is from, from uh, several months ago, but when I went today to go and look, um, there's 100, over 100 uh, publishers listed on this, on this uh, Google sheet, and only one of them still has their content freely available. The rest of them have closed it down. And, and the one publisher that's freely available is, is JSTOR. <laughs> so maybe not so, so relevant to COVID-19. Um, so, I mean, I think there has been uh, a, an incredible awareness raising of, of um, the, the need for open science, the value and the benefits of rapidly and openly sharing research outputs. Uh, Jennifer Dudna, who's uh, you all I'm sure know, is the Nobel Prize winner in chemistry this year. And she, she talked about three ways science will never be the same because of COVID-19. Um, greater public appreciation for science, better and faster communications that allow information to get quickly into the public sphere, and greater scientific collaboration. And I, and I very much hope that, that she's right, that this, this change will be a, a permanent change. Um, you know, it, it has been a wake up call for our governments, for sure, who mainly, who maybe at, 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 um, over the years have had open science and open access kind of on the back burner, but it wasn't a priority. Um, so the question is, you know, will this be a permanent impact or, um, or is there no turning back or will we turn back? And so just a couple of quotes I wanted to share with you. Um, Robert Ian Smits, who's uh, the former Director General of Research and Innovation at the European Commission and, and one of the architects of Plan S says, you know, let's turn this abnormal situation in which COVID-19 papers and data are shared widely into a normal situation. Or in the words of, of Vincent Larivière, who's a professor here at the University of Montreal, you know, how can we justify not making research on cancer or cardiovascular disease or any other type of research freely available as well? So um, I, along with my, my um, colleagues on the core executive board, um, uh, published a kind of um, blog on the London School of Economics blog where we're, we're calling for things not to go back to, to business as, as usual. So, you know, all that to say, I, I think there is a glimmer of hope and, and part of that glimmer of hope has come because of, of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, our forest maybe will start to grow again um, but I, I think it's very important to, um, to state that it won't, we will not be able to regenerate a bibliodiverse ecosystem uh, without concerted action on the part of a number of different stakeholders. And um, the paper that we published in April, which I referred to earlier, uh, which included a call for action, 
outlined a number of actions for different stakeholder communities. Um, and I, I didn't include them all here, but I just thought I'd point to specifically the ones for libraries. So two important things that we thought libraries could do to, to help improve the situation with bibliodiversity is, is first just assess the levels of diversity in, in, in existing investments. And, and I don't really think very many libraries have done that. And, and second is to, again, try to promote, investigate, pilot, and, and adopt models um, that allow libraries to fund uh, non-transactional services. So services um, and infrastructures, publishers um, that are not pay for access, but also not pay to publish as well. So I just thought um, I'd uh, end my presentation with a couple of um, a description of some some interesting new developments that uh, really um, are supporting bibliodiversity. Um, one of them is uh, what I was speaking to earlier is is looking at developing new funding models. And so there's this program in in Europe that's led by, by Spark Europe called SCOS. I've forgotten what SCOS stands for, but it, it basically um, has a, 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 a group of representatives from different organizations that are looking at the different open access and open science services. And then they make a recommendation to their members to fund the ones that um, have given kind of a check mark. So they're looking at you know, the, the governance and the functionality and, and so on of these services. Um, and recently we've seen um, the uh, French Open Science Committee, which made a, a, you know, a substantial uh, contribution to the services that were recommended through that SCOS project, um, funding open citations, the public knowledge project and the directory of open access books. And so I, it's not just the French, I know the Canadian um, consortia has uh, started to um, uh, direct money towards these types of services. So I think that's a really positive development. And then I wanted to point this other uh, thing out to you, which is the University of, of Amsterdam has uh, now has, instead of having an APC fund, it has um, a fund for um, funding diamond open access journals. So again, those journals that don't charge APCs. Um, this project um, based in, in Europe is also looking at how to create a model, a funding model that would work to fund open access content in books, open access monographs, but also be comfortable for libraries. So what, they've, what they're looking at is there's a closed backlist of monographs that are available to all subscribers, uh, or that are available only to subscribers and the front list of these. So the books that are coming out, out in the future would be made openly available. And um, I heard about this project a couple of days ago at a presentation. Um, so there are new funding models being developed and there are also some really interesting policies being adopted in countries around the world. Um, I don't know if you have been following um, Coalition S and Plan S, but originally when it was introduced, it was, it was um, uh, criticized for being too, uh, too much focused on transformational agreements. And I think they've really taken those criticisms to heart. They have adopted a rights retention um, uh, strategy. So all coalition S funders, which are mainly European, funder, European funders now, um, will require that researchers keep the rights for all their articles, which I, I think is an incredible, a very, very important development for the future. And if that could be expanded beyond those coalition S funders, it would be a, a game changer. Um, I thought I'd also uh, tell you about the new policy in China, which is really interesting because in the past they have been chasing the impact factors. And they, they did an about uh, a face rec uh, recently, about a year ago, when they announced their new policy for um, uh, assessment policy for researchers, 
which is that researchers have to publish in Chinese journals in the Chinese language. They have to publish three, the, three of their five articles per year need to be in Chinese journals, if, if I'm getting that right. And then they can publish two other journals um, in uh, high impact fact journals. But what they're trying to do really is bring back, bring back the articles so that Chinese public can have access to them in the Chinese language. And um, there may be other things behind that policy as well, but, but I won't speculate about that. Um, I think there's kind of um, a lot of innovation going on at the moment as well, because, because of um, there's this new openness uh, based on, on COVID-19. So we've really seen um, the advancement of uh, these, this new model, which is publish, then review. So publish in a preprint server, and then it gets reviewed afterwards. So um, uh, we've seen uh, um, a, a number of, of review services pop up that are not journals, they're just communities that review articles. And um, recently it was announced um, here, you can see in the science article, it was announced that um, these journals, 15 journals would not even do their own peer review anymore. They are using PCI, which is peer community in a, a, a peer review, external peer review service to do the reviews. And they just decide which articles they are going to endorse as published by their journal. Um, there's the rapid reviews journal um, that's also built on preprints um, that's hosted by MIT. And um, I wanted to mention uh, the core project, which I think is very, very important and will scale up these kind of innovations that are happening. So I see this, uh, the core notify project as scaling up bibliodiversity um, across the world. And what we're trying to do is develop a common protocol using linked data notifications that will connect repositories with review services. So we don't have to submit an article into a journal anymore. The journal, the article can be submitted anywhere in a compatible repository. And then there can be automated communications around the review of that article pushed out to any peer review service that is also compatible. And um, we're, we're at the moment, we're working, we're working on this protocol and we will have some real instantiations of this to show the community probably by the end of the summer. And um, I think not only, you know, is this building on the innovations in the community, but it's, it's solving some of the issues that we discussed before because the sustainability issue, for example, institutions fund their repositories, you know, maybe not always that well, but they fund their repositories. And so I can see them being interested in funding services that add value to the content in their repositories. Um, and and, and it, it's also about decoupling um, uh, some of the processes around scholarly publishing so that repositories and institutions take responsibility for archiving for providing access to content and the peer review services are focused mainly on doing the reviews and um, the reason why I say this is diversity scaling up is that any peer review service can connect as long as they have the technology and any repository can connect so we can really support different domain communities and different localized um, institutions regions and countries And then I, I, I wanted to leave again on, on a very positive note. Um, I don't know if any of you have been following the UNESCO open science um, recommendations. Um, this, was, this was a two year long process and maybe it wasn't as visible in the United States because I know that uh, the US is not a UNESCO member, but it was a two year long process with um, regional consultations, a lot of stakeholder engagement, um, 
a draft of the recommendations was developed probably six months ago um, by an expert group. It was shared with the member states. Um, and then last week and the week before, there were these really intensive meetings, which I attended as an observer, um, by over 100 member states, and they went line by line through um, the recommendations. Um, there was a co complete consensus by all the member states at that meeting that open science and open access uh, was uh, a priority and was incredibly important. And I, 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 um, it was incredible. Um, the, the director of science and policy and partnerships at UNESCO uh, said this in, in an email um, privately, but anyway, I can read it out to you. She said, I, I really think we have rarely seen an international normative instrument for which there was such a broad consensus and agreement among so many different countries. Over 100 countries participated in the meeting last week and the spirit of constructive diplomacy was just incredible. And um, I'd like to just show you some of the text of these recommendations because it's not just about open science, it's really about public good, science as a public good and making sure that um, as we advance open science collectively as a global community, that we maintain that fundamental principle. So um, the aim and objectives, I mean, it, it's a text of about 12 or 13 pages, but I just have a couple of, 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 of um, paragraphs I wanna share with you. Um, so, but I have to move this window, whoops. Um, so, uh, you know, this is about recognizing disciplinary and regional differences. Um, taking into account different actors, different countries, trying to reduce uh, digital, technical and knowledge divides existing between and within those countries. And the other thing I, I wanted to share with you was the, the fundamental principles underlying the recommendations, which are quality and integrity, collective benefit, equity and fairness, and diversity and inclusiveness. And this was just, um, there were no members speaking out against this. And I, I think there's just, we've gotten to a point now where there's such a strong awareness that it, it's not just about open science and, and open access. It's about ensuring that we leave no one behind. And with that, I will say thank you very much and, and we can open it up to questions. Well, we have one waiting for you. We have time for a few. So if anyone wants to ask questions, go into the Q&A function or the chat um, and we will field them or you can raise your hand. Um, so our anonymous um, person wrote, I was interested to hear you say that preprints vary little, especially regarding outcomes from published versions of the articles. An articulated concern faculty on my campus have about open access is that they believe that the quality of preprints is substandard compared to the published versions of the articles. Do you know if there's any epistemological evidence on this subject? Thanks for your wonderful talk. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Yeah, I mean, there are uh, the study that I, I um, referenced in um, in my, uh, in my talk uh, is a study that was done by ASAP Bio. So um, there's that study and there's another one that was, um, that's published as a preprint, I think. Um, and maybe if you could send me an email, I can send you those, those citations. I, I think the, the, the caveat with these studies are that they're comparing only the preprints that are have been published right so there are a number of preprints probably that never get published and um that's where really i think um there's a, a question around what is the quality of those preprints that eventually that eventually don't get published and whether there's an issue there so i think there needs to be more more study of, around this but um, certainly there, the, the research that's looked, that's compared the preprints with the, the final published version, there hasn't been a lot of, uh, a lot of difference. Do 
You're muted. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. And another question we have, can you speak to the environmental costs of mainstream megacorp publishing? <laughs> I don't, I can't actually, I don't really know what the environmental footprint of the publishing industry is, but it'd be really interesting to, to find out. I mean, um, you've, 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 um, you've suggested something to me that I think I'm, I'm going to go look into because I actually, I actually don't know about that. Well, thank you. Um, and we have one more, please um, go into the chat. Oh, we have a, do we have a chat question? Um, well, another question is how are free, and you mentioned this, but how are free and fair speech in academia and bibliodiversity linked? Oh, wait, let's skip that one and go here. If we don't include humanities in this new push towards open access measures, won't this create another divide with the emphasis on STEM? Do you see a strong and organized push to open humanities? And then we'll go to the second first question. Okay, okay. yeah, um, no, I think, you know, I use the term open science, but and, and the reason why I use the term open science is because it's the, the term that's commonly used mainly in the European context. <clears throat> so I think um, the, for example, the UNESCO recommendations are specifically point to the, the, the whole diversity of domains and are not restricted at all to STEM. So it's been a it's been a term that has been um, is started to gain traction, but it it does sort of misrepresent itself because I think um, certainly um, what we're thinking about is open scholarship writ large, not not specifically targeted at the STEM fields. Um, so. How are free and fair speech in academia and bibliodiversity linked? And you spoke to that um, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that's a difficult question because, uh, you know, what, what I think is, is happening is that it's, it's not, uh, it, it hasn't been presented as an issue of free speech, but it's sort of subtle incentive measures that push researchers in the direction of publishing in certain venues. And those venues, you know, define again what they feel is most is 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 priority science to be published. So um, I, I don't think there's been a strong connection made between bibliodiversity and free speech. Um, but I, I think they're, they are related in the sense that, um, you know, researchers publishing in, in smaller venues um, are somewhat invisible to, to the, uh, via the kind of international system of scholarly communications. Thank you. Um... We have um, one more. So how does the digital environment work for or against mono publishing, um, the onslaught of everybody publishing in a digital environment? In balance, I think it probably works for us um, in terms of making it easier for people to, to publish, um, you know, directly. But um, there are there are challenges around that. I mean, again, like it all goes back to the incentive system and what's officially recognized. So we really need to to break open. We need to go beyond our fixation on publishing in, in journal in in journals. Um, we need to uh, recognize that other types of of research outputs are of value that um, uh, non-traditional types of peer review can support um, uh, uh, sharing and dissemination of research outputs without having to go through journal publications. So, so in, in balance, I think it, it, um, it's, 
favors us and, and, and helps us in terms of advancing bibliodiversity, but there's still many challenges that have to be addressed around that. Well, thank you so much. Um, we are going to conclude now. That was um, a wonderful talk. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. And I wanna announce that our next speaker will be on August 4th, four to five p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Registration will be forthcoming. It's Dr. Rajiv Janjiani, the Associate Vice President teaching, of Teaching and Learning at the Kwantalan Polytechnic University in British Columbia. And, and we'll give a talk. It will be on, on access, impact, and the many unexpected rewards of open scholarship. If you want to revisit this recording of this talk, it will be available on the website. Josh will drop a link in the chat and future lectures and registrations will also be there. And thank you so much, Kathleen, for the wonderful answers to your question and questions and your wonderful presentation.